I'm Dr. Keon West from the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds, and I'm here to talk to you about why we use laboratory experiments in psychology. Psychology, as we know, is a science of the mind, so it's the knowledge about the mind that we gain through observation and experimentation. So imagine that you had a question, any kind of question, about the human mind or human behavior. It could be a question like, do violent video games make us more violent? Or another kind of question could be, does money make us happy? Or does therapy actually make us feel better? Does it make us any healthier? Or a very complicated question that I'll address a bit later, does imagining a conversation with Muslims make you nicer to Muslims in general? I'll get back to that one with a very specific experiment that I'll show you later. These could be reframed, these questions, in terms of hypotheses. Hypotheses in which a variable A affects a variable B. And the question we're trying to figure out is, is this relationship real? Does a change in A really result in a change in B? So we could take all of those and represent them exactly like that. The video games and the violence, the money and the happiness, and the therapy and the mental health. So how do we answer these questions? How do we search for these relationships between variables? The most natural answer is that you could observe. Most people will tell you, why not simply measure levels of A and levels of B and see whether or not people who are high in A are also high in B? Do people who play lots of violent video games also do lots of violent things? Do people with lots of money also appear to be very happy? That's an okay answer. If you look at observation, the idea is then that we observe the levels of A and B, the two variables, and we see if there is a relationship. If we plot that graphically, that would look something like this. You have A on the left, you have B underneath. We collect data points concerning video games and violence, for example, to put our first point up. That's one data point there. But in order to really understand the relationship between A and B, we need multiple data points, which would look something like that. Once you have multiple data points, you can then plot a relationship between A and B. And then you can see whether or not high levels of A are related to high levels of B. In this hypothetical scenario, we see that there is a strong relationship and a strong positive relationship between our A and our B variable, which means that, yes, we found that the more people play video games, violent video games in particular, the more violent behavior they actually exhibit. So we have observed this strong relationship between A and B, but can we now say that A causes B? Do we have any idea about this particular causal relationship? And the answer is no. We still have no idea, despite having found that A and B are very much correlated. And there's a reason for that, or rather there's three very specific reasons for it. It's because even if A is related to B, there are three possible scenarios that could explain that relationship. The first is a scenario that we were thinking of before, in which A causes B. Playing violent video games makes you more violent. That could be the answer. But the other possible answer is the reverse, that B causes A. That people who are already violent or already interested in violent things will then go looking for violent video games. And then there's a third answer, that maybe some previously unexplored variable is explaining both. Maybe people who are angry then display violent behaviors and play violent video games, Maybe people with too much time on their hands do violent things and buy violent video games. We don't know. But there could be another relationship or even a set of variables that we haven't even thought of that explain this relationship and make A and B co-vary together. So no, even with a strong positive correlation between one variable and another variable, we cannot say that that's because one variable causes the other. It's true for the video games and the violence. It's equally true for another variable, like money and happiness. Even if we find that people with lots of money are happier than people with no money, maybe people with money become happier, but also maybe people who are happy have money attracted to them. People like to give them more money. Or maybe people who are born into wealthy families or into the royalty happen to be both rich and happy because life's good if you're a member of the royal family, that kind of thing. So we can't really say that A causes B just from observing this relationship. So we have observed a strong relationship between A and B, but we know that observation alone cannot determine causality. To determine a causal direction, what we need is experimentation. So what is experimentation? In order to do experimentation, you need at least two steps. The first is an experimental manipulation. This means you have to do something. 
You have to do something to the participants, give something to the participants, change their situation in some way. The second thing it entails is measurement. So there must be, at some point, a system by which you check for your dependent variable, your B variable, after having altered your A variable, either up or down. Or to put it very simply, you manipulate your levels of A, and then you measure your subsequent levels of B. So, if we give participants more A, and we find that these participants respond with more B, then we know that A actually causes B. To put that in the terms we discussed before, if we give participants more violent video games and then they start to become more aggressive, then we know that this is actually what causes the aggression. Or if we give people money and they become happier, then we can say that money actually causes happiness. If we give people therapy and then they become better, we can say that therapy makes people better. And that's the way we can answer these causal questions by using experimentation. There are rules to experimentation, however. You can't simply go around giving people money, seeing that they become happy, and then saying, well, now we know that money causes happiness. There are ways you have to do experiments to make sure that they're done properly. One of the first rules is that you need a control condition. Hypothetically, you could say, yes, I gave someone money, and then they became happier. So that's an experiment that shows that money causes happiness. But what if you gave them a book? What if you gave them play money? What if you gave them anything else, and they also became happier, then we don't know if it's the money itself that's making people happy. And the placebo effect is a very real effect. And we know that if you do anything to people as a psychologist, they will respond in some way. So you want to check and make sure that it's not just the interaction with the participant, but specifically what you're giving them that's having the effect you're looking for. You also have to make sure that the experiments are double blind. This means that neither the participant nor the experimenter should know the condition that the participant is in. The participant might respond the way they think we want them to respond. That's called a demand effect. If the participant is convinced that we think the violent video game will make them more violent, they might do that just to make us happy. Similarly, if the experimenter is convinced that violent video games will make participants more violent, then the experimenter might judge participants as more violent because he or she knows they got the violent video game. These are things we don't even have to do on purpose. But if you're aware of the condition, you will tend to push people toward what you think they should be doing afterwards. The other thing is that we need to apply a certain level of statistical analysis. I won't go into the details because it gets fairly complicated. But how do you know if people with violent video games are more violent than people without? How do you measure it? I could ask a very simple question. We think, generally, that men are taller than women, but how much taller do men have to be before it's a real difference? How many men have to be taller than how many women before we can say this isn't just a fluke finding? Because you could find populations where the women are taller than the men, but that wouldn't be a real finding. One woman being taller than one man does not actually mean a trend. So at some level, you have to do the analysis to determine whether it's a real trend or just one thing that you happen to find. And the second way that we check whether the effect that you found is a real effect or just a fluke is through replication. If you found the effect, but somehow no one else can find the same effect, then it might not be a real effect. It might be because of you. It might be because of something you've done that you haven't written down or some other aspect of the manipulation that you're not paying attention to. So every time we go through these steps, we have to repeat them, or other people have to repeat them, to make sure that the experiment is true and that what we're finding is actually a real effect. To give you an example of an experiment that I've done recently, this is an experiment to figure out or to answer that question that I asked earlier. Does imagining a conversation with a Muslim make you behave more favorably toward Muslims? The reason we're doing that is because we know from the contact hypothesis, 1954, Gordon Alford, that interacting with other people makes you like them more. Recently, 2007, Turner Crispin Lambert looked into whether just imagining interacting with people had much the same effect. And they found that this imagination made you think more favorably about people, but no one's ever seen if that also makes you behave more favorably towards someone else. So it's a fairly important experiment, because if it works, then we can show that just by imagining things, we can make people be nicer to other people in a fairly straightforward way. To do that, we tested it with an experiment. So in order to have a proper experiment, we needed an experimental condition and a control condition. The experimental condition received the experimental manipulation. We instructed them to spend two minutes imagining having a conversation with a Muslim stranger. There were more instructions included in the set, but that was basically what they did. 
and those in the control condition did almost exactly the same thing, except there was no mention of Muslims. So they imagined having a conversation with a stranger, no Muslims mentioned. Now all the participants were not Muslims. They were white, non-Muslim undergraduate students. We made sure to measure that beforehand. And they were randomly assigned to one condition or the other condition. And we didn't know which condition they were in. And they were unaware of the fact that there were other conditions to be in. So we tested this as blind as we could. Our measure of niceness was the distance between their chair, when we told them to lay out the chair for themselves, and the chair that they laid out for a Muslim who was going to come and speak to them. Those who were friendly would place the chairs very close together, and those who were unfriendly would place the chairs very far apart. We tested it, and this is what we found. That on average, the participants who were in the experimental condition placed the chairs closer together than the participants in the control condition. I've included the statistics for those who are interested and a reference to the paper for those who'd like to look it up. But you don't have to know exactly what they mean. Just understand that these statistics show that that difference is significant. It's a real difference. I won't go through the other study we did, but it was almost exactly the same study, except we were doing it on a different group, people who were overweight. So we had students, again, doing the same experiment, and they placed the chairs closer together if they'd imagined that conversation than if they hadn't imagined the conversation. So that's the beauty of experimentation in psychology. But we have to say that experimentation has limits. There's a reason why we don't experiment on everything. One of the most obvious limits of experimentation is that of resources. We simply don't have the time or the money to experiment on everything. It would be nice, but it's just not the way it is. The other limit of experimentation is one of ethics. So we would really like to know, it is an important question, whether one childbearing practice is better than the other. But it's simply not an ethical thing to force people to raise their children in one way or another way, and then to test what happens. You can't blind condition people into one life or another life. That's not very fair. Similarly, if you look at epidemiology, they never infect people with diseases and then see what happens, at least not anymore. That's very unethical behavior. They simply observe, and they look at the patterns, and they take that as the evidence they'll have. And that's the best way we can do it so far, because actually infecting people would be unethical. And then the last limit of experimentation that I'll talk about is that of validity. So yes, in the lab, we got undergraduate students who were non-Muslims and white to sit down and imagine talking to a Muslim in our company, and then to lay out a set of chairs. But in real life, that never happens. Psychologists don't ask you to do that and then make you lay out chairs for people. So in what way can we say that this actually translates to real life experience or to real life behaviors? Now, we can get around that by designing better experiments and designing experiments that take into account more real life variables. But then we get back into the time and the money. So we're doing the best we can, but this is how they work. And this is how they help us understand what's going on. So in summary, psychologists use laboratory experimentation